Good morning. Welcome you here this morning. We're going to sing our first song. It will be number one in the book. Number one, Bound for the Promised Land. Sing all three verses before our scripture reading and prayer. Let's sing out together. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come? And go with me, I am bound for the promised land. O'er all those wide extended plains shine one eternal day. There God the sun forever reigns, scatters night away. I am bound. Our reading this morning is going to come from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Lord's Day where we're able to gather together and worship. Lord, we thank you for giving us the Bible that we can turn to it in times of need, in times of where we need comfort, where we need uplifting, where we need to just affirm the way that we are living our lives. Oh, we thank you for all the Bible class teachers that have prepared material this morning. Please help them to remember all that they have prepared. Help the students to be attentive to the words that are taught and to take something from the lessons. Thank you for again for all of the many blessings that you give us. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins that we may live in heaven with you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning again and welcome this morning to Bremen Church of Christ. We're thankful for everyone's attendance on this beautiful Lord's Day. And this is the first Sunday of our summer quarter. So with that, we are actually promoting uh, classes today. So if you have moved uh, from the fourth grade to the fifth, or the fifth grade to the sixth, then there's a change in the, the way those classes are designated. Uh, you will move up. Um, so everybody's in a new grade today. 
So teachers, please assist your students in uh, making sure that they are in the right class uh, for their grade level. Uh, also, the adult classes that are being taught this quarter will be in the fellowship hall. Chris will be teaching a foundations study, uh, basic principles of the Bible, including such topics as the plan of salvation, the way that the Bible is divided, Old and New Testaments, uh, authority, worship, church organization, false doctrines, and faithful, faithful Christian living. So a very good study uh, for new Christians and also a very good uh, uh, kind of a re-study for faithful Christians uh, of any age. So everyone is welcome to partake in that if they would like. Here in the auditorium, Chad is teaching the seven churches of Asia and uh, uh, certainly a very good study also uh, from the book of Revelation. So uh, with that, we'll dismiss now to our classes, nursery, preschool, kindergarten, elementary school first. Middle school, high school, and adult classes. Morning. Sound okay? I'm not too loud, am I? Don't answer that, Miss Joyce. As was mentioned, we're going to begin a study this morning of the seven churches of Asia. <clears throat> I have I have wanted to do a study of this for I don't know how long, <laughs> literally years. Uh, even I think I'd, I'd started thinking about it before we moved to Bremen. We were in Childersburg, and I, I really liked it and wanted to approach this and was trying to figure out exactly how to arrange it. And, of course, then we moved and settling in, and then I've decided, okay, I think I'm ready now. And I think I was just about ready to, to do the lesson series, and I'd find more material or a different approach to it or something. And so uh, then I got to thinking, I don't know if I want to preach this because these might be really long sermons. So uh, I start, started thinking it might be better as a class. So that's what we're going to do this quarter is to look at the seven churches of Asia or the seven churches of Revelation, different, different ways people title this. Uh, I want to, in this class today, sort of introduce... Uh, some of the backdrop of the book of Revelation introduce uh, the Christ who is speaking to these individual congregations and we may hopefully get into introducing the city of Ephesus. Uh, I want to, with, with, each, with each particular congregation, look at some, if we have some of these, we don't have a whole lot of knowledge of them, <clears throat> but talk about the city a little bit so you get, a, get an idea of where the people are coming from who live in that city. Uh, it helps you understand some of the message that is written to them in the letter from Jesus. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting thought to think about what if Jesus wrote a letter to this congregation? <clears throat> what would it say? Uh, would, would he commend? Would he criticize? Would, a little bit of both? Uh, would there be anything positive? Would there be anything negative? Uh, so these are, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about if, if Jesus were to instruct someone to deliver a letter right here. They say, give this to the messenger of the church at Bremen and read this letter before the congregation. Uh, that's what happened with each of these seven congregations. Now, I believe, uh, other, other commentators have said this, uh, I believe it's, it's true. Uh, there's, there's every reason to believe there were more than seven congregations in Asia, right? So why these seven? <clears throat> That, that seems to be the most logical uh, explanation. Seven used often in the, in the scriptures, uh, representing perfection or completeness. Uh, so the idea here that in these seven congregations, 
Now, I, I don't think there's any reason to suppose these are any less than a real congregation of real people. This is not a made up situation, but they are chosen because something in each one of them, good or bad, uh, a little bit of both, it, it's representative of churches everywhere. And so there's that seven, that, that completeness that we'll describe, and, and it's sort of a, you know, even now, some nearly 2,000 years later, we're studying it, and it's kind of, you know, the old saying, find yourself here, and, and you can. When you look at these, and that's, that's how I want to end this study, is to come back and think about in terms of what if the Lord wrote a letter to Bremen and, and sort of bring it all home and think about that because that's a, that's a sobering thought. But let's talk about... Um, oh, yeah, here, I'll mention this first. Here's a map that uh, obviously gives you an idea of uh, location of these, these congregations. Here they are in this little, uh, this is a pretty simple map. Of, there's another one I'll show you in just a little bit later. Uh, John is here on the island of Patmos. Sometimes we say things that are going to be based on tradition, church tradition as we sometimes call it. Uh, I will point that out when we do just to make sure. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to say I don't put any faith in it because many times what, what church tradition is is right. It's correct. Just understand, that's my caveat, because if it's church tradition, it's not Bible. It's not scripture, and obviously it's not the same weight as if it came from the Bible. But there's, there's a time of tremendous persecution going on. By the way, Ephesus is the first one we're going to look at, and you can see very logically, if you were a messenger and you traveled from Patmos to Asia Minor, that's your first stop, is Ephesus. And then Smyrna, and, and you know, it just makes the rounds. And that's, that's kind of the order that the letters are going to go in in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, but this is written, the, the backdrop of Revelation, that's what I was working to get to, is persecution. It's already going on. Uh, it, it's going to get worse. In fact, I think that's my, uh, my first one here. This is, a, this is a book written to suffering saints. And, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, John is suffering with them. Uh, he's their companion in tribulation, he says, chapter 1, and also in the kingdom. Uh, John is not exempt from this suffering. Uh, he's, he, and, and this is where one of those things with church tradition. Uh, church tradition says, uh, this would certainly not be out of the ordinary for, because it happened to other apostles, um, but you know, there were some apostles who were martyred. Maybe the Lord still had more work for John to do, but anyway, take this as it is, it's, it's church tradition, but what some of the church tradition tells us is that this is in the reign of Domitian, uh, somewhere around 96 AD when, uh, when, when the book of Revelation is written. But there's a tradition that says what happened was John, being a Christian, was condemned to death. And they threw him in a vat of boiling hot tar. And he was miraculously spared. That's why he finds himself on Patmos not being martyred as so many other Christians were. Obviously, you know, sometimes maybe you've read the book of Revelation or, uh, you know, looking at the date and the time of persecution and you've put it in that time period of Domitian and he really was ruthless against the Christians and you wondered, as I have, I, if I'm Domitian and I'm after these people that call themselves Christians, here's one who's still alive and his name is John and he calls himself an apostle and they're... They're ambassadors of Christ on earth. That's, that's first on my list. I want him, and I want him dead. Uh, so if that tradition is true, that would explain why he's not. You know, you sort of think, well, how, how does he escape all that? If that tradition is true, then that's, that's why he's on Patmos. Whatever the reason, as far as what we know 100% for sure, he was exiled to Patmos, this, this little small island. And while he's there, one day... On the Lord's Day, Sunday, he has this vision. It's, you know, it's kind of a panorama, however you want to view that. And he's going to receive this revelation from Jesus Christ. Uh, I often point out to people, uh, you know, just go ahead and say it at the very beginning. It's revelation, singular. Uh, we sometimes uh, slip into that. I'm not going to be the... Uh, 
police on that because if, if somebody policed everything I said wrong, I'd be in trouble a lot. But just make sure we understand that. It's not revelations. It's just one. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. Uh, sometimes I'll, I also hear people call John, John the revelator. Uh, I don't like that term just because he's not, he's not the revelator. He received the revelation from Jesus. But again, I, I understand what people are talking about, and I don't want to get too, too picky. But 10 major persecutions. Uh, just, just list these without too much comment at first. Nero, somewhere around AD 67. Uh, Domitian, we see Revelation written during this time. Trajan, 108. Marcus Aurelia Antoninus, if I'm saying that right, AD 162. Severus, 192. Maximus, 235. Decius 249, Valerian 257, Aurelian 274, and Diocletian uh, AD 303. Uh, now I just highlighted a couple of these because they have some special significance. Uh, Domitian is the time period during which Revelation is written. Uh, so when you, I show this to say right here, it's going to get worse. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot more to come especially for these immediate recipients of, of John's, well, the letters from Jesus through John. Uh, Diocletian, I pointed out, because that's the last one, and it ended with Constantine, who ends up legalizing Christianity. And uh, he, he embraced Christianity, at least a form of it. Now, keep in mind, Christianity has really, really, uh, a lot of error has crept in at that point. And, and so... You know, without getting into all that, I don't know how much of Christianity he embraced and how much it would have been kind of a apostatized version of it. But it, it was such, he grabbed onto that such, that for at least about a thousand years, you don't read of any more persecution. I mean, you, you see them here. They're just a few years in between many times. But for a thousand years, no persecution. And as great as that is, it seems like that's when the most corruption crept into the church. And that happens, doesn't it? We, we get comfortable sometimes, and when we get comfortable, like the Israelites in the Promised Land, everything's great, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and next thing you know, they're, they're worshiping idols. And you have some of God's own kings who are of the line of David that would offer their sons in worship to Molech. <clears throat> I mean, we sometimes, sometimes people use the expression, you know, so-and-so would roll over in his grave if he knew that. I mean, can you imagine if David had been on earth to see one of his descendants present his son in worship to a false idol, Molech, and, and fall down before it and then sacrifice his child? You, you talk about unbelievable. But that's what happens sometimes. We get at ease, we get comfortable, and we let our guard down, and, and many times error creeps in. Uh, but it, it's, it's interesting to study these. That list, by the way, comes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. <clears throat> you talk about an interesting story. Uh, that whole book is fascinating. He, he details a lot of different persecutions. But his personal story is amazing. I, I didn't realize this. I've, I've had that book for years, and... I was doing some research preparing for this class, but just reading about Mr. Fox's story will blow your mind. Uh, how he came to write this book and uh, the, the persecutions he endured. He, he, was, he had many times uh, those of the Catholic faith who were after his life, literally, uh, because this was during a time of Mary, Queen of Scots, whose nickname was Bloody Mary, because she was a zealot. For the Catholic Church. And if you were uh, in any way, shape, form, or fashion even looking like you might be part of the Reformation or having doubts, yeah, she, would, she would take you out. So, uh, interesting story when you read just about that fellow, but he details all these different persecutions and a lot of uh, some things listed as far as particular people and some of the particular things that happened. But all that just to say, that is the backdrop of the book of Revelation. Keep that in mind. The backdrop is not telling something that's going to happen 2,000 years later and telling about Russia rising to power and China and all this that people try to pull out of the book of Revelation. 
I, I, you know, that's one of those where, again, if, if those first century saints could come to today and hear people talking about that, they would just be, I, I am confident, angry and say, are you kidding? We're, we're suffering. We're giving our lives literally just because many times they're, they're held before a, a, a council and, and begged. Polycarp, that aged disciple, was begged. They didn't, want it. they didn't want to put him to death. They begged him, just renounce Christ and we'll let you go. And he wouldn't do it. And you got people today, that, that's the backdrop of Revelation, people giving their lives. And Jesus says, I want you to know that I know. And I want you to know that you stay faithful to death if that's what it takes. And I'm going to give you a crown of life. And then 2,000 years later, people start saying, oh, look, there's this Russia. And these are the signs that Jesus is going to come back soon. With all due respect, but give me a break. That's a complete ignoring of the backdrop of this book. You've got to keep that in mind. There's a, there's a fellow, I can't think of the name now. Uh, somebody, if you know it, just holler out. But there's a book called Revelation Through First Century Glasses. W.B. West. Is that West? Okay, I was, I was thinking it might be. W.B. West. Uh, that's a good way of putting it, though. When you read this book, or any book, Put on your glasses to get in the context of when was this written? What is the backdrop of that? That's good for any book, by the way, and not just Revelation. So there's your, there's your backdrop of the book. There's a lot of persecution going on. I, I realize some people take the position it was written during this persecution under Nero. I just, I don't take that position. Uh, I, I believe the book was written, Revelation was written somewhere around AD 96. I just think there's a lot more evidence uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, the internal evidence, and by that I mean the evidence right within the book of Revelation itself, you can interpret it either way as far as a Jewish persecution uh, or a Roman persecution, or is it talking about this, is it talking about that? But the external evidence to me is just too strong. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about is when we get to one of the congregations, I think it's Laodicea if I remember correctly, it, 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 around this era here, A.D. 67 or so, in the years shortly after that, they're recovering from a massive earthquake. They, there's almost no possible way that city is the rich, luxurious, relaxed, kicked back city that you read about in chapter 3 of Revelation. Uh, there, there are a lot of things like that that just, uh, I just don't think add up. So I think the best date is, is to go with A.D. 96. Uh, that's when emperor worship really came into its own. Yes, Nero declared himself to be a god, but quite honestly, when you study history, most people outside of Nero's court, and I think probably a lot of them inside his court that just were scared to tell him for fear of their lives, most people didn't take that guy seriously. He was a weirdo. And, and I mean, I'm not, trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to make light or anything, but that man had problems, serious problems. Uh, when you read about his upbringing, you understand why. He was brought up in the most licentious environment, as, as a lot of those Roman emperors were. But he had serious, serious problems. But, so a lot of people didn't really take him that seriously. He, he did claim to be a god, and he wanted to be worshipped. But emperor worship really came into its own around the time of Domitian. Uh, and, and shortly, I, I guess you could say even shortly before that. So, uh, but that's the backdrop of, of the book of Revelation. Uh, continuing that thought... There were some just unbelievable things done to Christians during this time. I mentioned John, the tradition telling us he was thrown into a vat of boiling hot uh, tar oil or something. It might, might have been oil. I said tar, but I, I can't remember. Uh, they, they would use all kinds of, uh, there were Christians that uh, they would tell them, renounce Christ. And sometimes they would even make a statement. Not just, I can't renounce Christ, but uh, they would make some statement like, how could I, how could I worship Christ? How could I give honor to demons? How could I give honor to devils, which is due only to God? And that would just sometimes infuriate the accusers. Sometimes it was the emperor. Sometimes it was uh, some kind of council. But sometimes they would just be furious. They would sometimes take animal skins and put Christians inside of them, sew them up, and let the animals then attack. Let a lion attack them while they're inside of this skin. I read about one Christian who was put into a sack filled with, uh, like a big burlap type sack. It's filled with vipers and scorpions. 
They throw him in the sack, seal it up, and they throw, toss him in the river. Uh, this is the kind of stuff being done to Christians. Uh, you know, just unthinkable. They would sometimes do what, what we call today drawn and quartered, uh, where you just stretch somebody out until you break nearly every bone in their body. And sometimes they would manage to live through that. And then they would take them and do something else to them and continue this persecution. It was just unbelievable. And it's, it's literally a case of sometimes torture, just unthinkable torture. And literally they say, okay, renounce Christ. We can end this right now. You know, it's like one of those movies you see where the guy's torturing somebody and he wants information. And he's, he's just telling them, look, well, we can end this right now. All you got to do is... And, of course, you know, you're always thinking when you watch those movies, you know, yeah, he's lying. He's going to kill you either way. But many times, you know, we, we read a lot. You read a book like Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read about the ones who, who stayed strong. There are a lot who didn't. And, and some of them did not stay strong. Some of them relented. <clears throat> and I read of one who had just been, oh, he'd been tortured. And, and he recanted. And... The, uh, the way Fox puts it is almost as soon as the words had left his mouth, he fell down and expired. He died. And a 16-year-old girl in the audience stood up and she said, You fool, for a moment's respite, you have renounced the one true Lord. You know what happened? They grabbed her. She, she stood up and she spoke. Just kind of an outburst, you know, seeing all this, they grabbed her. They began torturing her, and she ended up giving her life that day for the Lord. A lot of stories of soldiers coming to get, well, they came to get Polycarp. You know what he did? He fed them, sat them down and gave them a meal, and asked them if he could have a moment to pray, and they gave him that. And there are a lot of stories of the captors, the ones coming to get somebody or taking them or watching this happen, being Convinced. I don't know if I'd say converted. Fox says converted, but obviously there's more to conversion than just believing. Uh, but, but at least being convinced. Now, whether it later led to a conversion or not, I don't know. But, but many times saying, uh, there were soldiers who were Christians. Some of them even elite soldiers, Praetorian Guard and things like that. And you read about a few of them. And sometimes uh, the, a group of soldiers are being gathered together by the emperor and we're going to offer sacrifice here's two or three guys that aren't offering sacrifice. What's going on, guys? Well, we can't. We're Christians. <laughs> You're what? And then it starts. You've, I'm graciously going to give you a chance to recant that statement and sacrifice to the gods. And if they didn't, and many times they didn't, they, they would be killed, the same as your regular old everyday commoner. Three soldiers that were pretty famous, very, very decorated soldiers, we would say. The emperor found out they were not Christians. I can't remember whose reign this was under. This was one of those later on, later on persecutions. But the emperor found out they were Christians. He had to, he had to leave for something. And he, he said, by the time I come back, you better have recanted. And so while he was gone, they, they ran away. They ran off and escaped, hid themselves in a cave, Somebody went and told on them, said, that they're in this cave over here. So the emperor proceeds to, he just blocks, blockades the cave and leaves them. And, of course, they end up starving to death inside. But this is some of the stuff going on against Christians. Again, this is the backdrop of <clears throat> the book of Revelation. There, skeletons in the Roman catacombs uh, tell a horrible tale. Lots of people are, are buried in the Roman catacombs, or were buried. Uh, they... They would bury pagans, they would bury Christians, you know, wh whomever. And so they're, it's interesting as they find, you look on the outside and these things look pretty similar. But sometimes you would open up a Christian's burial site. There might be a head severed from the body, ribs, shoulder blades broken, uh, bones that were severely charred, burned. Sometimes they couldn't even get uh, there. Uh, I can't remember if it was Polycarp or another one I was reading about that the Romans said, no, you're not getting the body, you're not getting anything. And uh, they, they burned it so badly that the Christians were trying to gather up whatever they could that was left just to try to give a proper burial uh, and get some closure, as we sometimes say. But it's interesting, despite all this, that some of the inscriptions are just, <clears throat> they're fascinating. Being called away, he went in peace. These are sometimes found on a body with the head severed. 
bones burned. Obvious torture that this person endured. And, and that's the inscription, being called away, went in peace. Wow. God give us that kind of strength and faith. And, and another one, victorious in peace and in Christ. Of course, you can contrast it with some of the pagan inscriptions. That's interesting to do. Here's one. Live for the present hour since we are sure of nothing else. What a miserable philosophy of life. Once I was not, now I am not. I know nothing about it, and it is no concern of mine. This, this is the backdrop of Revelation. John is going to remind, Jesus through John is going to remind these Christians, you're not like that. You've got hope. Hang in there. Yes, sir. I know. But, but then with the Christian belief, there is an eternal consequence to that with certainty of the Christian. So you'd think that they would be the ones that would say, either you're going to convert or we're going to kill you. But it's just the opposite. Which is, I mean, it's fascinating once you start to digest the two contrasting beliefs on who should be tolerated to live in their current Yeah, I mean, even if you're going to be a pagan, you believe in all these gods and, and, you know, one's not really necessarily above another. Well, the Christians have this God they call Christ. All right, so what? That, that, you'd think that would be the mentality, you know? If nothing else, kind of think they're, they're strange, they're weird, they're whatever. But why go after them the way they did? And I don't know. That, you know, that's just... A, uh, that's a funny thing about human nature sometimes is I, I don't like uh, somebody thinking of me that what I'm doing is wrong. And, and some people just go after that. Uh, but it is interesting. You would think, if anything, it would be the Christians who would be the ones, you know, literally almost holding the sword to somebody and saying, you're going to convert. But it was the exact opposite way. Uh, it just amazing. But that's the backdrop of the book of Revelation. I'm going to move through this quickly because I preached on this a while back. In fact... I preached on this thinking I might uh, use that to kind of segue into this. Y'all hear that? Is that just me? I don't know what's doing that. Is the mic still on? It's my heart? Don't tell me that. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to move through this quickly, as I was saying, because I, I was thinking even using this when I preached on it as kind of a segue into, thank you, uh, kind of a segue into this series, and uh, that was one of those times when I ran across some more material and thought, oh, I don't know if I want to approach it like this or not. But anyway, uh, I just want to mention, you know, this is the one who is speaking to these uh, congregations, uh, the sovereign, Jesus. Uh, you know, you, you have the description given in chapter 1, uh, all, these, all these different things, but we, we talked about in that sermon, this is the main thing I wanted to get to. Let me pull all these up, and I'm not going to go through all these scriptures, but I just wanted to bring this up. The, uh, the hair, the, the white, uh, whiteness of the hair representing purity, the, the eyes representing, where's my pointer? Eyes representing uh, the penetrating glare of Jesus. Not, not that he's trying to find fault, but just the idea that he sees. What is he going to say to each congregation. How does each letter start off? I know. I know. Jesus knows. He knows what's going on in your life and in mine. He knows what's going on with the church at Bremen and every congregation that belongs to him. He knows. Uh, and and that's, that's not meant to be a terrifying thought. That's meant to comfort us. But it also helps remind us that, that he knows. And so we want to be aware of that. Uh, presence, defeat. He, he's He's walking among the churches. In other words, he's, he's, again, he knows what's going on. He's there. He's present. Uh, power, the voice. His, his voice represents his power. He holds the, the seven stars in his right hand. That's protection. We, you know, we sometimes saying he's got the whole world in his hand. Well, the churches are in Christ's hand. He is, he's in, and, and you think about that, knowing the backdrop we just saw. 
to know that the churches are held in his right hand. The right hand represents what? Power, strength. And he says, I got you. You know, sometimes when, when somebody's slipping or something and you reach down and you're, you're trying to hold them, you say, hey, I got you. We, we were talking the other night, Johnny, about the um, rugged maniac race. <laughs> and the, there was, a, it was an obstacle course race that a few of us did. And there's a thing at the end where you have to come up this wall. It's kind of a curved wall. And I was completely uh, exhausted at that point. And uh, I was thankful that Johnny and somebody else was there because they reached down. They said, I got you. And they pulled me up. And uh, those poor guys had to lift my whole 190 pounds all by themselves because I was not offering much help. I couldn't get, I couldn't get my feet on that thing. And so we were laughing about that the other night. But, you know, to know that you're in the right hand of the Almighty. And he says, I've got you. No matter what people can do to you here on this earth, I've got you. And I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of in eternity. You, you think about that to a first century church that is suffering like we just described. Of course, he, he is a priest and that's the uh, uh, garment there, priestly garment. The sword coming out of his mouth, uh, that he, his pronouncement against these churches in favor and against. He's going to have some, some negative things to say as well. And then, of course, uh, the radiance being like the sun, just representative of perfection. That's who's speaking here. This is not just a message that John is sitting down to write. This is from Jesus Christ, the resurrected, glorified Christ, who is King of kings, Lord of lords. That's, that's who's addressing each congregation. So keep that in mind. He's going to say it's to the angel of the church at wherever. Uh, people have debated a lot, of, a lot of different things about what is the angel. Is that talking about an angel? Uh, but keep in mind, the word that's often translated angel is a generic word. It may mean an angel like we think about angels. It may just mean a messenger. And that's probably the most logical explanation is that this is some kind of a messenger that is sent. Some people say, oh, is that the bishop? Bishop's not even a scriptural idea except in the term, in the sense of multiple bishops. Bishop is an elder. Uh, so we know it's not something like that. Just some kind of messenger. Uh, I think we probably dwell on that way too much. I've seen some people break that down so much, and, and, and you know, it's like you're missing the forest for the trees. This is not about the messenger and who the messenger is. This is about a message to each congregation. And if we miss that, we're missing everything. Uh, there's a certain pattern that these letters will go by. There will be an intro, introduction to the city, uh, the recipient of the letter, and then also to... The Christ. Uh, and again, that's going to go over some of those features that we just went over now. And so we won't always dwell too much on that, but I wanted to mention that in the beginning. But, so it'll introduce the, the city to the angel of the church at Ephesus, as we'll see in just this little while. <clears throat> and then it introduces Jesus as well as one of those characteristics that are given in chapter 1. One or more of those characteristics. Then there's a commendation. Then there's a correction. And a consolation. Uh, this is a scriptural pattern, by the way. Uh, you, want, you want to know the best way to deal with somebody if they need correction? I know it's not always expedient, but <clears throat> I think there's a lesson here. Uh, I, I've, I've had people before, uh, sometimes they march in and they, they, they say, listen, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to fix. I've had uh, bosses. I, I've even had situations where elders would say, okay, here, here's something we don't like. We want this changed to whatever. But I've also had people, elders, bosses, sit down and say, uh, Chad, let's, let's go over a few things here. <clears throat> I want you to know, in this right here, you, you, you're doing great. You, you're doing excellent. Well, one of the first works I ever did, well, it was the first work I did out of preaching school, uh, was as an associate. I had a lot to learn, uh, and, and there, there were so many things. I still have a lot to learn, but uh, there, there was just so much there that I didn't, I didn't know, wasn't familiar with or whatever, and uh, I remember very well Brother Terry Mabry. He was, he was the best at this. He'd call me in, and he'd say, hey, you, you, your work with the teens is amazing. I, I just, I've been blown away. He said, you know, we do these little Tuesday night Bible talks. He said, I've never seen so many teens uh, showing up 
for the Bible talks. You, you're, you're just, you're doing great with that. And he just, and then there's this. And uh, your, your, your sermons are excellent. They're biblical and they're well organized. And on and on. I mean, and, and, and after about 10 minutes of this, I'm just flying high. And, and he'd say, now here are a couple things I think you need to work on. Well, by the time he got to that, I'm like, hey, I can do this. Lay it on me. I'm, I'm ready to fix whatever because you, you've built me up so much. And so that's the, you know, that's the reason I say this is a biblical pattern. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to commend them. <clears throat> you see this especially with Ephesus. Here's some things you guys are doing. Great. I mean, you don't tolerate this. You don't put up with that. And, and you're doing this. You're doing that. But I have somewhat against you. And then he's going to get into the correction. Builds them up. Then he says, here's some things you need to correct. And then he offers the consolation. You, you, you take care of this problem and you're going to be blessed for it. There's a reward in following what the Lord says. So there's a, uh, by the way, this is just an alternate. Some people uh, arrange the pattern differently, especially if you like the uh, alliteration part. There's the Christ, the commendation, the criticism, the counsel, and then the consolation. So basically the same thing, but just one, one guy worded it a little bit differently, so I thought I'd put those side by side. But that's the pattern that each letter will follow to each. Maybe that is me. I keep... <laughs> what did you do while I go, Joel? You fixed it. Uh, I think I did something to make it start back. Maybe there's like a hot spot here or something. I don't know. Uh, but that's the pattern these letters will, will follow. I'm trying to decide how far I want to go before we run out of time here. <clears throat> Uh, let's, let's talk about Ephesus a little bit. I, I can at least introduce the city. Uh, Ephesus is located in what is today, it's modern day Turkey. I, I think most of us are probably familiar with that. <clears throat> Fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome obviously was the largest. Then there was Alexandria. Then there was Antioch in Syria. And then there's Ephesus. So this is, this is a big city. I'm trying to think, in, in the United States, it's what, New York City, L.A.? Uh, Chicago's three. Does anybody know who's four? Houston. I can always count on Scott. <laughs> um, the, the stuff that you have ro rolling around inside your head as far as trivia is just amazing, Scott. Houston. So it'd be like Houston today. That, that's, a, that's amazing that you knew that, Scott. But... There you go. There's uh, Ephesus. You know, be, you get an idea looking at, obviously not quite the size of those cities uh, back then. I think, uh, in fact, I didn't put it on a slide, but I'm trying to remember. I want to say what I read was 300,000 or so population of Ephesus. Uh, so, you know, that back then, that's a huge city. You can imagine. Rome made Ephesus the administrative center of Asia. We'll, we'll see on a map in just a moment. You'll, you'll see where that makes a lot of sense. Turn to Acts chapter 19. I want to notice this. <clears throat> the, the town clerk, he, he reported directly to Rome, and uh, that's the reason he gets a little antsy and nervous in Acts chapter 19. Somebody read for us. Uh, well, verse 38 is not really part of this. I just included it because I wanted to remind myself to mention something. Uh, he, he says, if Demetrius and the craftsmen uh, which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies. Is what the King James says. Anybody got a different word there? There's a more Roman word there. Proconsul. The proconsul. That's, that's the deputy. And he says, let them implead one another. So there's, there's this idea of a Roman proconsul. He's, he reports directly back to Rome. So that's, that's what he's talking about there. Now, <clears throat> look at uh, verse 39. He says, If you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. Watch what he says, verse 40. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. There's a big uproar, and Rome hears about it, then they want to know from the town clerk, the proconsul, what's going on in your city? You see, if a city was considered peaceably submissive to the Roman Empire, a lot of times they would give them a proconsul. They, they make it what they call a free city. 
Uh, so you don't have to have all the heavy hand of Rome on you because they're in submission. They're, they're on board, we would say. And so they have a proconsul, and he reports to Rome. But if there's a problem, then guess what? He reports to Rome. So that, that could work both ways. Uh, obviously, Ephesus is famous for the Temple of Diana. Uh, it's, it's also famous for a theater that is there, this, this massive theater, 24,000 to 500 to somewhere around 25,000 capacity. Uh, just an amazing structure. Uh, to this day, you could get up in the top row of a 25,000 capacity theater and someone can stand down on the platform and read and you can hear it in the top row. That's pretty amazing acoustics. Uh, that's amazing engineering. But that's Rome. I mean, they, they were renowned for that kind of thing. Uh, but that's... Ephesus is, is sort of famous for that. I guess that might actually be Greek structure, wouldn't it? Uh, the, the theater, I don't know. They also discovered a great auditorium, which is possibly the school of, uh, the location of the school of Tyrannus where Paul is going to teach for the space of about two years. In Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. It's interesting, uh, the ancients, especially during the time of Rome, they would get up at, at around the crack of dawn, literally, and they would conclude their business by usually around lunchtime. This is not, well, I was going to say it's not because they're such diligent people. I guess you, there could be some diligence to that. But the main reason for that was they just kicked back and relaxed, and especially some of the pagans. They would, would what people today is to say, they partied in the afternoon. It was just, they're going to they're gonna take it easy and engage in whatever uh, indulgences they want in the afternoons. So that's why they would conclude all their business. But uh, that, that meant that somewhere around 11 o'clock, most people estimate, is when Paul had use of the school of Tyrannus. And so he would use it from somewhere around 11 to what we would call 4 in the afternoon to teach and, and train people and teach the Bible. Uh, th this is what I wanted to mention, just looking at it by comparison. Y'all come on in, I'm wrapping up here. <laughs> uh, there's Patmos. There's your seven congregations. But I want to mention the other large cities that we talked about. Rome, uh, it's not on the map, but Alexandria, and it's not on the map either, but Antioch, somewhere in this region. Uh, so you can see why it makes sense that Ephesus is a kind of a hub there. It's, it's a port city as well, which also makes it very um, popular, gets a lot of traffic. Uh, it also makes it wealthy. It's a pretty wealthy city. Uh, there's your theater. Another look at the theater. Those pictures are not the highest resolution, so they kind of blurred a little bit. Uh, here, here you see some streets. You, you see some amazing Roman road construction, which we'll talk about in just a moment. I did, totally did not plan it that way, but it just kind of happened. Okay, we'll stop there. Lord willing, next Sunday we'll introduce the church at Ephesus. Some of these congregations that are here in Revelation 2 and 3, we don't know anything about them. Uh, as far as very much besides what we find right there in the text. Ephesus, we know a ton about besides what we find right there in Revelation 2. So that's what we'll pick up next Sunday. Thank you very much.